Well, thank you, Brandon, and welcome to all of you who are watching this wherever you may be. The question, was Job real, is a really good question because there are a lot of biblical characters that we really struggle to confirm the existence of outside of the books that bear their names. But as we think about this question, it might be important for us to consider how we would prove the existence of anyone living before the age of photographs and video. Consider, for example, how you would prove the existence of one of your relatives from maybe 150 years ago. Could you ever actually definitively prove to anyone who is a skeptic about that person's existence that they actually existed? Maybe you have their name in a family Bible, or maybe you see them on Ancestry.com in a family tree, and, and, and so their names you know, but can you really know anything about them other than the fact that somebody wrote their name down somewhere along the way? In fact, when we start to dig into this question at a deeper level, what we find is it's really difficult, if not in some respects impossible, to confirm absolutely beyond the shadow of a doubt whether anyone in pre-modern times existed. And so when we look at Job, we have to keep that same thing in mind. So what are the sorts of things that we do see whenever we look uh, for the existence of, existence of a historical person? Uh, next slide, please. One of the things that we want to pay attention to is we want to pay attention to the references to them outside of the books that bear their names. Next slide. Yeah. So one of the, one of the things that we see is there are external te uh, testimonies to certain people's existence. For example, in the book of Ezekiel, we have a reference to the character of Job. In Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 14 and 20, we have a reference to, in both of those verses, the existence of Job. Even if these three men, Ezekiel says, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in the city of Jerusalem, they would deliver but their own lives by their righteousness, declares the Lord. In other words, the city of Jerusalem is so corrupt that God is going to destroy that city by sending the Babylonians against them. And even if these three men, these great heroes of faith, Noah, Job, and Daniel, even if they lived in it, the only people they would be able to save is themselves. That's how far away from the truth the citizens of Jerusalem were. Almost exactly the same thing is said in verse 20 a little bit later. Even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, declares the Lord God, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would deliver but their own lives by their righteousness. Even the city of Sodom, described in Genesis 19, features Lot, who was able to escape with his daughters. So even he was able to save his daughters. What Ezekiel says is that Jerusalem is so sorry, so corrupt, that even if those three people were in it, they couldn't even save their own family. Now, what that tells us is, at least for Ezekiel, Job is not merely the character of the book of Job, but he is a real historical person who is noted for his righteousness. Now, some people might say, well, wait a minute. How can you use the Bible to confirm the Bible? That's not playing fair, is it? Well, here's where we Christians may have been guilty a bit of miscommunication. You see, we typically treat the Bible as a single book. In fact, that's what the word Bible means, the book. Ha, Biblos in Greek, the book. And so we seem to communicate sometimes that the Bible is one consistent book. But we actually know that that's not true. Not only does the word Bible never occur in the Bible, but it's more appropriate to think about the Bible in terms of an ancient library of texts written by different people in different cultures at different times with different perspectives, even in different languages. And so the Bible is not a book although we agree as Christians that it speaks with a consistent voice, but it is a collection of books. And so if Ezekiel makes reference to Job, that does not necessarily mean the Bible is confirming the Bible. It means Ezekiel is confirming the existence of the character Job. Another consideration is the New Testament. The New Testament makes repeated reference to the book of Job, but in one case, in James chapter 5 and verse 11, the New Testament says, Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. 
Notice here that Job is described as an example of patience, an example of endurance, or as this translation has it, steadfastness. And the idea behind this description is that we ought to look to Job as inspiration for how we live. Now, of course, James is dependent upon the book of Job. He knows the book of Job and references the book. But the idea that Job was a real person seems to be assumed both by Ezekiel, who was a near contemporary of Job, and by the New Testament author of James, who lived centuries after Job. But we can do more than that. Not only do we look for external testimony as to the existence of the individual, we can also look for details within the book itself. And we see that there are a number of details that can be confirmed by the historical record in the book of Job. For example, in Jeremiah 25, verses 17 through 20, the Bible describes the place where Job chapter 1 and verse 1 says Job lived. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. Now, it may be that we as readers of the Bible don't know a whole lot about the land of Uz. It it doesn't appear a lot of places in the Old Testament, but it is found in significant passages like the one we just mentioned from Jeremiah 25. This is a passage where God brings this cup and it's full of an intoxicating beverage. And the metaphor is God is going to pour this beverage into the mouths of all the nations of the world and he's going to make them drunk so that they will stagger, so that they will be confused, so that they won't know what's going on. And as drunk people are prone to hurt themselves, the nation the nations by their drunkenness will lead to their own destruction. It's a very graphic prophetic image uh, that we find in Jeremiah. But among the nations listed, whom God is going to force to drink this mixture is us. We also have in Lamentations chapter 4 and verse 21, in a similar context, the following being said, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom. Now pay attention to that. O daughter of Edom you who dwell in the land of Uz. Notice that Uz is connected with Edom. So if we wonder where Uz was, this passage actually helps us out. It was in the land of Edom. Now, what's the land of Edom? The land of Edom represents the territory that the descendants of Esau settled. So you have the story of Jacob and Esau in the book of Genesis. The descendants of Esau settled in the land of Edom, which was Esau's nickname. Now, as it turns out, those peoples shared a historical border with the people of Judah. And there is constant tension between the nations of Judah and Edom that goes on for century after century after century in the biblical period. Now, one of the things that's fascinating to me is that especially at the time of Ezekiel and probably the time the book of Job is written in the 6th century BCE, what we find is that the tension between Judah and Israel, uh, or Judah and Edom, rather, had reached sort of a fever pitch. In fact, the book of Obadiah, one of the shortest books that we have in the Bible, describes this tension and actually says that the Edomites participated in the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem. Recent archaeological evidence, and when I say recent, I mean like these articles have just come out in the last few days, Recent archaeological evidence actually confirms that information, that there is evidence of the Edomite destruction of certain cities in the southern kingdom of Judah around this time period. And so what we find is that these people were despised. They were hated. Obadiah says God is going to destroy them and they will never rise again. So here's my point with all of that. Who in their right mind would make up a story about a foreigner from the land of Edom who was a great example of righteousness. Such a great example of righteousness that his name could be listed alongside Noah and Daniel in the contemporary book of Ezekiel. Who on earth would make that story up? The answer is no one would. In fact, the lack of believability of Job being an Edomite associated with the land of Uz is actually confirmation of its credibility but we can do better than that. Notice also there are historical peoples mentioned in the book of Job. In Job chapter 1, verses 15 and 17, we read about the Chaldeans and the Sabaeans. The Chaldeans, that's just another name for the Babylonians. They were the nation in power during the 6th century. We know about the career of Nebuchadnezzar and the empire that he helped to establish. 
But this other people known as the Sabaeans, those peoples are not well known from the historical record. In fact, the time when they are most closely associated with the Chaldeans, as far as we know, covers about a 10-year window from about 550 BCE to about 540 BCE. In other words, it's the last decade of the existence of the Babylonian Empire. The only time in history, as far as we know, those two nations, the Chaldeans and the Sabaeans, were associated, Sabaeans uh, being an Arabian people. And so what we find is that the author of Job, yet again, if he's writing toward the middle to late 6th century, is spot on in terms of historical details that match a very narrow window uh, on the historical landscape. More than that, the name of Job fits naming customs current to that time period. We don't know exactly what the name of Job means, depending on how one uh, manipulates the Hebrew. It either means, where is the father? In which case, it would probably be emblematic of the fact that the book of Job is all about crying out to God, where are you when I suffer? Why won't you do more, God, to help me in the midst of my trouble? And so maybe it means, where is the father? The name could also mean one who is enemy. That is one who has been made an enemy of God or people or whatever the case may be. Uh, we don't really know for sure, but what we do know is that the form of the name linguistically actually fits the time period uh, of the first millennium BCE quite well. So here's the point. If somebody made up all these details and got them all right, they were some kind of storyteller. It's much easier to believe that this is a person who actually lived during that time period who recorded historical details with great accuracy about the people and the times and the history. Next slide, please. But we can do even better than that. We can also talk about details within the book itself. So is Job a historical person? I think the answer, there's at least really good evidence to that being yes. But what about the book of Job? Is that historical? Because the opening of the book of Job features this character known as Satan, and he's standing around in the throne room of God making demands and all of this sort of business. And it seems that God and Satan are bargaining in a way that you don't see really elsewhere in the Bible. And so a lot of people say, man, that, that kind of sounds mythological. That, that looks to me like it may not be historically accurate. Well, of course, none of us was in the throne room of God to confirm the details of that particular situation, including the author of the book himself. But it is the case that there are other details within the book that help to confirm the basic reliability of the text. First of all is the opening of the book. Uh, I teach the book of Job at the graduate level, and, and so sometimes students will say, you know, the way the book of Job opens, at least in English, it sort of sounds like a fairy tale. You know, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And so it sort of sounds like once upon a time. That is not at all how that text is trying to communicate. In fact, a, a, maybe a more accurate rendering of the Hebrew text would be something like this. A man was in the land of Uz. Job was his name. That doesn't sound nearly as much like a fairy tale as many English translations have it. And so if you're basing that belief on the way the book sounds in English, there's a little more to it than that. Secondly, there are details within the book that seem to confirm the reliability, basic reliability of the book. First of all, as we've mentioned, Job was a non-Israelite. What that means is Job is one of the only characters in the Bible to be exalted as an example of faith who lived during the time of the Mosaic Law who was not of the nation of Israel. Again, if you had to make up a hero, would you pick Job? It must be that he actually lived and that his righteousness was legendary. In addition to that, Job lived to be 140 years old, Job 42 and verse 16. And while today that seems like an excessively long lifespan, actually scientists by even modern standards tell us it is quite possible for the human body to live to be 140 years old. And so while that would be a really old person today, it's not a crazy age. Uh, we know of ancient texts that exalt the reigns of kings to the point where they're 30,000, 36,000 years long. That's an impossibly unbelievable number. The book of Job gives us a number that is actually fairly easy to believe. There are also uh, major questions of theology that would have been of interest to the audience. The doctrine of retribution, you know, the idea that 
sometimes people have is that the righteous are supposed to prosper for their righteousness and the wicked are supposed to suffer for their wickedness. The book of Job is largely about this issue. And Job's friends who come to visit him, Bildad, Eliphaz, and Zophar, uh, they have this idea that Job must have sinned in some kind of incredible way or else he would not be suffering the way that he is. And Job says, no, I, I haven't done anything to deserve what I'm going through. God, God is doing this to me unfairly. And so much of the book of Job is Job's defense of himself and his friend's accusation of him. Whereas elsewhere in the Bible, we find more nuance to this question. Why would an author have made up such a simple way of looking at a complicated question? The third thing is the composition of the book. The book of Job is written in a brilliant literary style. In fact, some of the greatest literary minds of all time have remarked about the quality of Job. For example, Victor Hugo once said about the book of Job that it is perhaps the greatest masterpiece of the human mind. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Thomas Carlyle once said of the book of Job, it is the most wonderful poem of any age and language. There is nothing in the Bible or out of it of equal literary merit. Now, what are these people talking about? Well, the book of Job is written in the Hebrew language with a mixture of Aramaic words. Now, we don't want to go into a lot of detail about that, but here's the modern effect. If you've ever watched a movie that is set in, say, World War II, you'll notice something that is interesting about the German soldiers. Much of the time, the German soldiers are speaking English. Now, we know historically that's inaccurate, right? Because German soldiers spoke, guess what? German, not English. But they always speak their English with an accent so that you, as the viewer of the film, can identify them as sufficiently different from yourself. They are foreign. They are different. Uh, every movie I've ever seen about Jesus, I think, Jesus speaks English with a British accent, which I'm pretty sure wasn't the case historically, but it's an attempt to identify to us that he is foreign. He is different. He's not like us. The book of Job is written in exactly the same Hebrew style. And so the author was a literary genius who was communicating in a way that would have stuck with people. And indeed, that's what happens. We find that the book of Job remains among the most popular books throughout the ancient period. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, there are four manuscripts that survive of the book of Job, much more evidence of its existence. In the first century BCE, we have the existence of the Testament of Job, a way in which apocryphal books sometimes honor biblical characters is ascribing the last will and testament of their authors to them. Job is a hero of that genre. Job was translated into Greek at a very early date. Job is mentioned some 29 times in the New Testament, either directly quoted or alluded to in some sort of way. So the New Testament authors really understand and appreciate the book of Job. And so what we're saying is throughout uh, the history of reception, ancient exegetes, both Jewish and Christian, found value in the book of Job, which they would not have done if they thought the book was a myth or they thought the character really wasn't real. He was just made up somewhere along the way. And so last slide, please. And so we need to be careful whenever we're looking for proof for the existence of a historical person, a person like Abraham, a person like Moses, a person even like Jesus, not to get to the point where we say, we'll only believe what the Bible says if something outside the Bible confirms it. We wouldn't do that with any other source, and so we need to be fair to judge the Bible at least by the same standard that we use to judge other books. And so we need to make sure that we don't just say that something because it sounds mythological is a problem, but we actually take the time to investigate it and apply the canons of common sense to the analysis of something like the existence of a person and a book like Job.